All through his life, Confucius advocated filial piety and as part of his legacy, classic of filial piety gives an account of a dialogue between Confucius and his disciple Zheng Zi, Zheng Shen, on the subject of filiality. When Confucius was at his abode, and his disciple Zheng Zi was in attendance on him, the master said, Shen, the ancient kings had an ultimate virtue and a crucial principle. By practice of it, the people were brought to live in peace and harmony, and there was no ill will between superiors and inferiors. Do you know what it was? Zheng Zi rose from his seat and said, How would I, Shen, lacking intelligence, be able to know this? The master said, Our bodies and hair and skin we received from our parents and must not presume to injure or wound them. This is the beginning of filial piety. The Classics of Filial Piety, Chapter 1, The Scope and Meaning of the Treatise Once, when Confucius was unoccupied and his disciple Zheng Zi was sitting by in attendance on him, the master said, Shen, the ancient kings had a perfect virtue and all-embracing rule of conduct through which they were in accord with all under heaven. By the, by the practice of it, the people were brought to live in peace and harmony, and there was no ill will between superiors and inferiors. Do you know what it was? Zheng rose up from his mat and said, How should I, Shen, who am so devoid of intelligence, be able to know this? The master said, It was a filial piety. Now, filial piety is the root of all virtue and the stem out of which grows all moral teaching. Sit down again, and I will explain the subject to you. Our bodies to every hair and bit of skin are received by us, by us from our parents, and we must not presume to injure or wound them. This is the beginning of filial piety. When we have established our character by the practice of filial cause, so as uh, to make our name famous uh, in future ages and thereby glorify our parents. This is the end of filial piety. It commences with the service of parents. It proceeds to the service of the ruler. It is completed by the establishment of character. When Confucius was at his abode, in his dormitory at the school, his disciple Zheng Zi was in attendance on him. As a student of Confucius, Zheng Zi was obliged to serve his teacher. Confucius stressed filiality in that one should be filial to one's parents and likewise be respectful to one's teachers and elders. So, for instance, sometimes Confucius might like some tea and Zheng Zi would oblige with a cup of tea. He would take care of things that Confucius wanted done. Confucius said that the ancient kings, China's former sage, the imperials of Yong, had an utmost virtue, the greatest and of the highest degree attainable, and a crucial principle which is most important, to which they were in accord with all under heaven. By the practice of it, the people were brought to live in peace and harmony. If the common people made use of this principle, they would treat, strive for peace, and there was no ill will between superiors and inferiors. Do you know what it was? Confucius asked. Zheng vacated his seat. He got up and said, How would I, Shen, being very dense and lacking intelligence be able to know this no i do not know the master said confucius went on to say that our bodies and hair and skin we received from our parents and must not presume to injure or wound them 
Do not casually harm or damage them. This is the beginning of filial piety, the start of filiality. However, currently there is a group of individuals in the United States who misunderstand filiality. What is that about? Raven China's Confucius says, Our bodies and hair and skin we received from our parents and must not presume to injure or wound them. This is the beginning of filial piety. A bunch of hippies crop up who do not cut their hair or wash their faces that would amount to injure the hair and wound, wounding the skin. You see, that thinking is wide of the mark. To not presume to injure or wound them does not equate to not cutting one's hair or washing one's face. It is telling you not to bring damage to them. Haircuts are part of the times. Since the going chance call for haircuts, then one should go with the chance. Today's hippies want to turn the times around. Brandishing Confucius says, yet at the same time, guess what? They smoke opium and the marijuana and take LSD as if those do not injure or wound their bodies. Those things kill off who knows how many body cells ruin their health and practically run their bodies down. They chalk it up to filiality and meanwhile their parents are the furthest, furthest thing from their minds, consigned to oblivion. Ask them who their parents are and they draw a blank and they are supposedly observing Chinese finality. That is a complete mix-up. This erroneous thinking needs to be completely corrected. From refusing to cut their hair to engaging their bodies in shady dealings, even robberies and vices, where do you suppose they will end up? If one day they should get gunned down, that would truly be unfilial. Once they get into illegal dealings or robberies, they will either end up killing some policemen or getting killed by the police. Now, is that to not presume to injure or wound them? The beginning of filial piety, what a mistake. Me being in this country, I wish for this country's citizens to follow rules and abide by the law, and therefore I hope to set this deleterious habit right. Do not give in to hatred and resentment. Adopt the nature of the sages and worthies. Be careful with your thoughts and actions. Wherever we are, we should be of benefit to the local people, to that country and to the world. Do not be a menace to the world. That is my wish. If everyone behaves this way, rejecting work and refusing to be productive, this country will definitely go downhill. Therefore, as we are now learning the Buddha's teachings, we should all take up jobs and by working at our jobs, help the world and humankind. By setting good examples ourselves, we influence the society so that human minds as a whole will change for the better. That is the responsibility of Buddhists. The United States has a great legal system and many fine institutions, especially the edu education system which has made education widely available and better. It serves as an example for the world. Just one more thing to add to that. If everyone also learns to be filial to his or her parents, and as it is said, a super person tends to the basis for when the basis is established, the way comes forth. Filial piety and fractional regard, are they not the basis to being human? If they can further find that basis and source, then when everyone is filial to their parents, his country, this country will definitely prosper. A superior person needs to find the foundation and source, and once the foundation and source can stand firm, the way will come forth. What is the foundation? 
filial piety toward parents and fraternal regard for siblings, i.e. courtesy toward one's siblings and peers, no fighting. Filial piety and fraternal regard are the foundation for everyone. People who are filial to their parents steer clear of the various illegal dealings and abide by the law making them good citizens of the country. When all the people of the country have become good citizens, they can serve as good citizens of the entire world. They will lead the humanity as a whole well onto the right track. That is why the first order of business for everyone is to know to be filial to his or her parents. Otherwise, what is the point in parents having kids? After giving birth to them, the parents still have to raise them for the next 18 years and then the kids fly away from the nest, leaving their aging parents behind. Sure, the parents can move into retirement homes and will have the government as their support system, but there is no kindred affection to speak of. They are left on their own, almost like they are all alone in the world and with no one to rely on. It would be best for children to show filial devotion and care for their own parents, allowing them peace of mind in the winning years of their lives. Or else, once the kids grow up, they fly away just like birds, offered to no one knows where. Of lambs and crows, a Chinese saying goes, A lamb kneels to nurse, the crow returns to feed its parents. When a young crow grows up, it finds the food for its parents and nourishes them until the old crowds are strong enough to fly again. Only then will the young crowd's duties come to an end. Therefore, to the Chinese people, the crowd is the filial bird. When a suckling lamb takes milk from mum, it kneels down on its four legs. Humans who fail to be filial to their parents do not even measure up to lambs or crowds. That is not intended as a put down, rather a principle that everyone should be aware of. It is especially efficacious if humans can be filial to their parents. How is that so? The story of Kuo Chu. There is a Kuo Chu burying his baby story in China that goes like this. Kuo Chu was a very poor man, the poorest of the poor. He had a wife and a baby son. He also had a very old mother. His mom had lost all their teeth and could not eat any solid food. So she would take the milk of her daughter-in-law, that is, up until the baby came along. Now, with the two mouths to feed, there was not enough milk to go around, and both grandma and the baby were left hungry. If the milk were to go to feed grandma, the baby would starve to death. If the milk were allotted to the baby, grandma would die. So it was up to Kuo Chu to come up with a solution. Kuo Chu talked it over with his wife and, being the most filial person, presented this rational. Since we both were still young, we could have many more children in their long married uh, life ahead. But mom was uh, very old and her days uh, were numbered. So they should dispose uh, of the baby for now to focus uh, on keeping mom alive. Tougher as it was uh, for his wife uh, to give up the baby in order to fulfill their filial duties, uh, she relented in the end. After reaching a decision, in their family meeting with uh, meeting and with the baby in town, the couple headed out to the wilderness. What had been their pride and joy, they were now going to bury in the ground. Going to bury in the ground. No sooner had they begun digging than they hit the jackpot, a huge trove of gold and silver in gods and all with the wording heaven's gift to Philo San Guoji inscribed on them. 
the idea to bury the baby came about because they were poor. Now that they had struck it rich, they could afford to scrap that plan. This public record is well known to every Chinese person. Many Chinese willingly follow filiality not out of greed for riches, but because they recognize the importance of filial piety. Five is a transmission and translators. Fifth, the translators. According to some editions of the sutra, the Earth Star Sutra was translated by a Chinese Tripitaka master, Dharma master Fa Deng, Dharma Lamba Sika, the later Chen Dynasty. Some other editions list the translator as follows: translated by Tripitaka master Shramana. Shikshananda of Yudhyana during the Tang Dynasty. Yudhyana during the Tang Dynasty. During the Tang Dynasty, roughly bordering China's Yunnan province, there used to be a kingdom whose name Yudhyana, which had a mythical origin. Legends had it that at a time when the kingdom did have a name which was beyond recall, its emperor. Who was a hilly spread so the deity of the local temple for the sun. Out came a baby boy from the forehead of the deity's image. Isn't that incredible? However, this baby boy refused to drink milk. No human milk. No cow's milk for him. Later, an other-like structure appeared on the ground. And uh, the baby boy would nurse on the milk produced from the earth. That was how the country got the name Yudhyana, a Sanskrit term meaning earth milk. No ordinary cow's milk, mind you, but earth's milk. Thus, the name Earth Milk Kingdom. Quite a legend. A Chibitaka Shramana hailed her from Earth Milk Kingdom. Speaking of the term Shramana. Since its Chinese transliteration is shaman, sand door. Some Dharma masters poorly versed in the lecturing of the sutras would explain it like this: sand, river sand, sand door, a door made of river sand, and this monk goes in and out of that door. Thus, shaman, sand door. That is wrong. Shramana is a Sanskrit term translated into Chinese means. Diligently cultivating precepts, samadhi, and wisdom, putting an end to greed, hatred, and ignorance. The phrase has the same meaning as shramana. Diligently cultivating precepts, samadhi, and wisdom. Do not be lazy. Do not think getting more sleep does、uh, you good. It might feel natural for your physical bodies to sleep more, but it is unnatural for your dharma body. So diligently cultivate precepts, samadhi, and wisdom, and put an end to greed, hatred, and ignorance. Shikshananda, Shikshananda, also Sanskrit, translated into Chinese, means study with delight. This shramana was never lazy and was most delighted in learning the Buddha Dharma, learning the Suragama Mantra, the Great Compassion Mantra, and all the areas of Buddhist studies. It gave him great joy. Thus, his name Shishananda. Translated to translate is to render the Sanskrit texts into Chinese. It refers to an exchange. Is changing the identical text in Sanskrit for Chinese. The Chinese word for to translate is Yi. During the Zhou Dynasty in China, an office was created so overseas languages used in the four directions of the land. The official installed in the north was called Yi, and this word has since come to mean. To translate, that was a fifth. It's a transmission and translators.